our mission statement. William F. Buckley, Jr., November 19th, 1955. There is, we like to think, solid reason for rejoicing. Prodigious efforts by many people are responsible for national review. But since it will be the policy of this magazine to reject the hypodermic approach to world affairs, we may as well start out at once and admit that joy is not unconfined. Let's face it. Unlike Vienna, it seems altogether possible that did National Review not exist, no one would have invented it. The launching of a conservative weekly journal of opinion in a country widely assumed to be a bastion of conservatism at first glance looks like the work of supererogation, rather like publishing a royalist weekly within the walls of Buckingham Palace. It is not that, of course. If National Review is superfluous, it is so for very different reasons. It stands athwart history yelling stop at a time when no one is inclined to do so or to have much patience with those who so urge it. National Review is out of place in the sense that the United Nations and the League of Women Voters and the New York Times and Henry Steele Commager are in place. It is out of place because in its maturity, literate America rejected conservatism in favor of radical social experimentation. Instead of covetously consolidating its premises, the United States seems tormented by its tradition of fixed postulates having to do with the meaning of existence, with the relationship of the state to the individual, of the individual to his neighbor, so clearly enunciated in the, in the enabling documents of our republic. I happen to prefer champagne to ditch water, said the benign old wrecker of the ordered society, Oliver Wendell Holmes, but there is no reason to suppose that the cosmos does. We have come around to Mr. Holmes's view, so much so that we feel gentlemanly doubts when asserting the superiority of capitalism to socialism, of republicanism to centralism, of champagne to ditch water, of anything to anything. How curious that one of the doubts one is not permitted is whether at the margin Mr. Holmes was a useful citizen. The inroads that relativism has made on the American soul are not so easily evident. One must recently have lived on or close to a college campus to have a vivid intimation of what has happened. It is there that we see how a number of energetic social innovators, plugging their grand designs, succeeded over the years in capturing the liberal intellectual imagination. And since ideas rule the world, the ideologues, having won over the intellectual class, simply walked in and started to run things. Run just about everything. There never was an age of conformity quite like this one, or a camaraderie quite like the liberals. Drop a little itching powder in Jimmy Wetchler's bath, and before he has scratched himself for the third time, Arthur Schlesinger will have denounced you in a dozen books and speeches. Archibald McLeish will have written ten heroic cantos about our age of terror. Harper's will have published them, and everyone in sight will have been nominated for a Freedom Award. Conservatives in this country at least those who have not made their peace with the New Deal, and there is serious question whether there are others, are non-licensed non-conformists, and this is a dangerous business in a liberal world, as every editor of this magazine can readily show by pointing to his scars. Radical conservatives in this country have an interesting time of it, for when they are not being suppressed or mutilated by the liberals, they are being ignored or humiliated by a great many of those of the well-fed right, whose ignorance and amorality have never been exaggerated for the same reason that one cannot exaggerate infinity. There are, thank heaven, the exceptions. There are those of generous impulse and a sincere desire to encourage a responsible descent from the liberal orthodoxy. And there are those who recognize that when all is said and done, the marketplace depends for a license to operate freely on the men who issue licenses, on the politicians. They recognize, therefore, that efficient getting and spending is itself impossible except in an atmosphere that encourages efficient getting and spending. And back of all political institutions, there are moral and philosophical concepts, implicit or defined. Our political economy and our high-energy industry run on large general principles, on ideas, not by day-to-day -day guesswork, expedience, and improvisations. Ideas have to go into the exchange to become or remain operative, and the medium of such exchange is the printed word. 
A vigorous and incorruptible journal of conservative opinion is, dare we say it, as necessary to better living as chemistry. We begin publishing, then, with a considerable stock of experience with the irresponsible right and a despair of the intransigence of the liberals who run this country, and all this in a world dominated by the jubilant single-mindedness of the practicing communist with his inside track to history. All this could not appear to augur well for National Review, yet we start with a considerable and considered optimism. After all, we crashed through. More than 120 investors made this magazine possible, and over 50 men and women of small means invested less than $1,000 apiece in it. Two men and one woman, all three with overwhelming personal and public commitments, worked round the clock to make publication possible. A score of professional writers pledged their devoted attention to its needs, and hundreds of thoughtful men and women gave evidence that the appearance of such a journal as we have in mind would profoundly affect their lives. Our own views, as expressed in a memorandum drafted years ago and directed to our investors, are set forth in an adjacent column. We have nothing to offer but the best that is in us. That a thousand liberals who read this sentiment will say with relief is clearly not enough. It isn't enough. But it is as this point that we steal the march. But it is at this point that we steal the march. For we offer, besides ourselves, a position that has not grown old under the weight of gigantic parasitic bureaucracy, a position untempered by the doctoral dissertations of a generation of PhDs in social architecture, unattenuated by a thousand vulgar promises to a thousand different pressure groups, uncorroded by a cynical contempt for human freedom. And that, ladies and gentlemen, leaves us just about the hottest thing in town. The Magazine's Credenda among our convictions. 1. It is the job of centralized government in peacetime to protect its citizens' lives, liberty, and property. All other activities of government tend to diminish freedom and hamper progress. The growth of government, the dominant social feature of the century, must be fought relentlessly. In this great social conflict of the era, we are, without reservations, on the libertarian side. 2. The profound crisis of our era, in essence, the conflict between the social engineers who seek to adjust mankind to conform with scientific utopias, and the disciples of truth who defend the organic moral order. We believe the truth is neither arrived at nor illuminated by monitoring election results, binding though these are for other purposes, but by other means, including a study of human experience. On this point, we are without reservations on the conservative side. The century's most blatant force, three, the century's most blatant force of satanic utopianism is communism. We consider coexistence with communism neither desirable nor possible nor honorable. We find ourselves irrevoc irrevocably at war with communism and shall oppose any substitute for victory. Four, the largest cultural menace in America is the conformity of the intellectual cliques, which in education as well as the arts are out to impose upon the nation their modish fads and fallacies, and have nearly succeeded in doing so. In this cultural issue, we are without reservations on the side of excellence rather than newness, and of intellectual combat rather than conformity. 5. The most alarming single danger to the American political system lies in the fact that an identifiable team of Fabian operators is bent on controlling both our major political parties under the sanction of such fatuous and unreasoned slogans as national unity, middle-of-the-road progressivism, and bipartisanship. Clever intriguers are reshaping both parties in the image of Babbitt gone social democrat. When and where this political issue arises, we are, without reservations, on the side of traditional two-party system that fights its feuds in public and honestly. We shall advocate the restoration of the two-party system at all costs. 6. The competitive price system is, is indispensable to liberty and material progress. It is threatened not only by the growth of Big Brother government, but by the pressure of monopolies, including union monopolies. What is more, some labor unions have clearly identified themselves with doctrinaire socialist objectives. The characteristic problems of harassed business 
have gone unreported for years with the result that the public has been taught to assume almost instinctively that conflicts between labor and management are generally traceable to greed and intransigence on the part of management. Sometimes they are, often they are not. National Review will explore and oppose the inroads upon the market economy caused by monopolies in general and politically oriented unionism in particular, it will tell the violated businessmen's side of the story. 7. No superstition has more effectively bewitched America liberal, America's liberal elite than the fashionable concepts of world government, the United Nations, internationalism, international atomic pools, etc. Perhaps the most important and readily demonstrable lesson of history is that freedom goes hand in hand with the state of political decentralization, that remote government is irresponsible government. It would make greater sense to grant independence to each of our 50 states than to surrender U.S. sovereignty to a world organization.